Hello, great to be with you all today. I'm so thrilled to see this room full of people that are ready to start thinking about marriage, even though it's probably not exactly what you're experiencing in this moment. It shows me this is a room full of really smart people who know the difference that is made when we plan ahead and think ahead and don't just jump in and figure things out as we go. I started dreaming about my own personal happily ever after when I was in middle school. And I lived next door to a family that was European, and I was their babysitter. And every summer, this stream of young, handsome European men would come in, and they would do summer internships in Duluth, Minnesota. And as this young babysitter, I would just watch them and listen to their accents. And I would say to my best friend, someday, I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to marry one of them. I'm going to move to Europe, and I'm going to live in a castle. So that was kind of our thing that we always said. Well, fast forward, just after my freshman year of college, I was waitressing, and into my section of the restaurant walked this really, really good-looking European guy. It was one of the cousins, for real. And so I started chatting with him, and, you know, the rest is history, because we fell in love. We started dating at that point, and our courtship was pretty incredible. We dated kind of all over the world. We would meet in London, or meet in LA, or meet in Scotland, and we really never were together for long periods of time. We would just see each other on our breaks. And right before my senior year of college, he flew over, and we went to Mass, and at the end of Mass, we were kneeling and saying a little prayer, and I could kind of hear him rustling next to me, and I looked down, and he was on one knee, and he had a ring out, and he said to me, if I promise to make you happy for the rest of your life, will you marry me? And that ring had the purest diamond that he could buy in the middle. And on either side was a sapphire. And he had had that ring designed, and what he said was, the, the diamond in the middle, that's Jesus in his purity. And the sapphires on either side, that's us. And if we will look at each other through Christ, we're gonna be able to love each other so much better and love each other as we should. So 26 years of marriage later, <laughs> seven kids, and recently I just became a grandmother. The two on the end just had a beautiful baby boy. We are still growing strong. And you know, that has everything to do with keeping Christ to the best of our ability at the center and practicing principles that I started to think about and learn when I was in college. And I think a lot of my friends thought, this is kind of a weird time of life for you to be so marriage focused, because we're all working on our resumes and thinking about all sorts of other things. Um, but I'm so glad, I'm so glad I was intentional then, because it really has made an enormous difference in my marriage. You know, I think all too often we look at our relationships as something that's out of control. Like our love life, it's just going to come together and happen when it happens. And we don't feel like there's much that we can do to really make it happen. And so we put our focus entirely on how we're going to plan our careers. But I really believe that's putting our priorities out of order. And I want to challenge you to start planning and thinking strategically about your marriage now. And doing that does not make you old-fashioned, clingy, doesn't make you pathetic or desperate. It actually means that you're smart, that you're ahead of the game. Because the truth is, after your decision of whether or not that you are going to follow Christ, that is the most important decision you will ever make in your life, the next most important decision is who you decide to marry. That decision is going to impact your family life your faith life, your finances, your lifestyle, your retirement, even death, it is going to impact everything. So I want to encourage you to start thinking about your marriage with your eyes wide open. I want you to pay attention and recognize the ways in which our culture has lied to you about marriage. And I want you to look hard at the truth of what it takes to save your marriage before it starts. So I'm going to do this by introducing you today to five lies, and I'm going to be, de be debunking them with truth. So let's get started with lie number one. 
Line number one, getting married will fix what's broken in my heart. The truth, marriage actually only intensifies your brokenness. All too often, we come into relationships expecting the other person to be to us that which only Christ can be. We want somebody who is always patient, always says the right thing, always willing to forgive, offers love and respect, never is selfish, meets our needs perfectly. But that's a description of Jesus, not of a potential spouse. Now, when Leo proposed with the words, if I promise to make you happy for the rest of your life, will you marry me? He meant that sincerely. And I believed he could do it utterly. But that is actually a promise that no person can keep. Because we live in a fallen world, we are all the walking wounded, not a single one of us gets through life without some damage on the heart level. And I want you to take a little sec here and think about your life. Think about your heart. Think about times when you know that you really experienced some deep hurt. You know, some of us feel like we've been passed over or rejected or discarded. You may have experienced abuse Divorce and the breakup of your own family. Perhaps you've been mistreated. Have you had deep disappointment, grief, experiences with anxiety? All those things are indicators that there have been some wounds on the heart level. And some of our brokenness has come to us as a result of choices that we have made. And some of the brokenness has come as a result of others' choices that have impacted us. And in our desire to have the broken places within us healed, what we almost always do is we turn to the person who's pledged to love us the most, and we want them to come in and to heal us. We look to them to make us happy. But that is something that no person can ever do for us. And when we pin our hopes on another person in that way, when we think that somehow their love is going to fix what's broken in here, it's going to make up for what's lacking, it's going to fill the emptiness, we always come away disappointed each and every time. Because there is only one Savior. And that Savior will never be the person that you marry. And coming with those expectations into the relationship will place a burden on your spouse that is far too much for any person, even the most amazing person, to be able to bear. But I'm not saying that those hurts don't matter and aren't significant, that they should be stuffed down or hidden away. Proverbs 4.23 tells us that we are to guard our hearts, for in it are the sources of life. And what that means is that it is out of our hearts that everything comes. Our our mission, our personality, our dreams, our coping mechanisms, our decisions, all of this is coming up out of the overflow of the heart. And we're told to guard our heart in Scripture. But I think so many of us hear that concept of guarding our hearts, and what we've actually done is we've barricaded our hearts, or we've shut our hearts down, or we've shoved them to to the side, and we thought, okay, yeah, I've had some of these things that have gone on, and and they've been hard, and yeah, it's been hurtful, but you know what, I'm, I'm strong, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm getting on with it, and we don't realize that what we're doing is we're not dealing with it, we're shoving it to the side, and that is not what God means by guarding our hearts. And I think all too often, when we shove our hearts to the side and and our, our wounds to the side, what we focus on instead is doing the right thing. What am I supposed to do here? And we, we become quite achievement-oriented. And this can seep into the spiritual life as well, where we come at the spiritual life and we focus on the outward behavior, on doing the right thing, on doing what does it take to be a good Catholic. But I want you to know that Jesus wants more for you than behavior modification. He wants your heart, and he wants your heart set free. But to do that, we've got to own our own stories. 
And I think for most of us, we really want to ignore chunks of our stories, chapters of it that are really hurtful to go back and look at. But those chapters, those untold chapters, are the ones that most need to be told and processed through, both for your sake and for the sake of others. And the ideal time for you to process your story and work through these things is before you get married. And so I really recommend that you would consider good Christian counseling. And this is the way I would put it. You deserve good counseling. Dealing with your past and seeking healing is critical, and it's ideally done before getting married. Lie number two, it doesn't matter if he or she shares my faith, if he or she is a good person. The truth, what feels like a tiny difference now will grow to be a painful disconnect later. When you get married, it's as if you are both taking off in separate planes from New York City, and you're heading west. And to begin with, that slight difference doesn't seem like it's making that big a deal. But right after takeoff, a slight difference and a slight change in course is going to be the difference between landing in either Seattle or landing in San Diego. And once a plane is on its way, it's going to take a major rerouting, a major detour to bring those planes back together to the same place. So when you first get into a relationship, there are so many things to talk about. There are so many things to discover about each other. And so it's really easy to put faith to the side and to say, well, that's something that's personal to me. That's something that's an important part of my life, but it's not something that we have to share because look at all the other things that we do have in common and do unite us. Look at all these other areas in which we're so compatible. So using that example of the airplane, so you've both taken off from New York City, and at the beginning, the distance doesn't seem that great. There is a spiritual distance, but is it really going to make that big a difference later on? Well, fast forward to the inevitable struggles that come with marriage. That moment when you look at the other and you realize, you're actually not making me happy in this moment. And when that happens, and that happens in every marriage, what you need is more than that initial love that you had for each other because very, very many people who are married will say, you know, there are moments where that love kind of runs out. It runs a little dry. And in that moment, what you need is you need God to be the glue that holds you together. But what you have instead with this illustration is actually spiritual distance. You're almost in San Diego. Your spouse is almost in Seattle. And now that distance feels really acute. I travel around the country and I speak mainly to women. And do you know consistently what I hear from women is their greatest heartache and their greatest pain? It is this. It's this, this disconnect that so many of them are experiencing in their marriage. Why? Because many of them are in these challenging times of life where they know that it would make such a difference if they had this additional source of strength of having God at the center, but that's not what their experience is. And many of them are mothers who are trying to pass their faith to their kids, and what they really want is a partner in that, and instead what they feel they have is a partner who on some level undermines their efforts or at the very least provides the opposite example of what they're really wanting their kids to do. But another reason why this is so painful is because we have a desperate need to be known. And when your faith is a huge part of who you are, but it's a part of you that is not of interest to your spouse, then a big part of you is gonna remain hidden. And that part of you that is actually most important. The part of you that is most integral to your identity is one that is not understood and known, and it's not something that you can share with the person that you love most. And what this causes is a really deep loneliness in marriage that is real. Ecclesiastics 4.12 says that a cord of three strands will not easily be broken. 
And when you braid together a man, a woman, and God, that gives you a strong foundation for marriage like nothing else. And the major spiritual rerouting that is needed to bring the two together later on is going to be harder to accomplish once you're married. And I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I'm saying it's really, really hard. And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, Well, one thing, we so often come into relationships thinking that we're going to be able to change the other person a little bit to make them more who we want them to be. I'm just telling you right now, that is a super bad plan because it pretty much never works. And when it comes to the spiritual life, that's, of course, an intensely personal decision. It's not one that we can make for another person. And it's not one that we would ever want to feel we had coerced a person into doing because it wouldn't feel real anyway. No one can make this decision for someone else. The third lie that I want to look at is this. My porn use will not damage my marriage. The truth, porn is not just one more digital activity, and it's sabotaging what we ultimately want, a good marriage with a healthy sex life. You know, the most dangerous battle is the one that you are in when you don't actually know that you're under attack. You are the most vulnerable when the enemy is after you and you are clueless to the fact that you are even vulnerable. And I think that so many of us know there's something really off in the way that dating and sex is going in our culture. Like, we feel it, but I don't know that we recognize the ways that we are playing right into the enemy's trap. For many people, porn is just one more digital activity. It's a way of relieving stress. Many people would put it in the same category as social media or as binge watching. So I ask you, is it the same? Is porn viewing something that can be, in a sense, put in a box, and will it stay there? Or is it going to seep out and start to affect other areas of our life? Sorry to tell you, porn will not stay in the box. It will seep out, and it will start affecting the areas of your life that matter ultimately the most to you. What is porn doing to us? Number one, it is taking the edge off of our desire. So the internet makes it easy to gratify basic social and sexual needs instantly. And what this means is that there is far less incentive to get out there and to take risks and chase after those things for real. Now this doesn't mean that the internet gives more satisfaction than a real relationship and honest, good, healthy sex does, because it doesn't. But what it does is it gives you just enough to take the edge off of your desire. It dulls your desire enough that it reduces your willingness to take a risk to go into that awkward space of trying to date and fi- trying to find the right person with a real, a real satisfying relationship. And another thing that porn is doing is it's messing with our brains. Porn is extremely addictive. Why? Because it's causing us to be captured by extreme versions of natural rewards. So when a person experiences arousal, they get a hit of dopamine. And when they get that hit of dopamine, it kicks in a molecular switch in our brains, releasing something called Delta Fos B. And Delta Fos B is a protein that starts to accumulate in the brain. And what it does, it starts to actually alter the brain and it promotes a cycle of binging and craving, in a word, addiction. Now, what does addiction cause? Always, it causes a numbed pleasure response, which means it's going to continuously take more and more and more to bring that same level of response from us. So what does this look like? This looks like somebody sitting alone with a phone or with a computer, searching, clicking, looking for novelty, looking for surprise, looking for shock. And what impact does this have on our future marriages? Well, first of all, if it's taking the edge off of desire, if it's reducing your willingness to get out there and risk and pursue a real relationship, then obviously romance is much, much less likely to happen for you. 
And it is keeping strong, capable, and passionate people stuck in a rut instead of getting out there and actually living a real life with real people. And porn use is cited as a major factor in 56% of divorces. 56%. So do not tell me that it's private and that it doesn't have impact. And I know that one in three porn users are women, but I also know that 70% of young men from the ages of 18 to 24 are viewing porn. And so I just want to talk to you guys for a sec and say that we know, we know we're being compared. I'm speaking on behalf of women here. We, no matter how old we are, no matter how skinny we are, how beautiful we are, how built we are, how whatever, we are loaded with so many body image insecurities. And we feel that we are being compared. And even when you're married, we feel all that come into the bedroom. And you know what it does? It shuts us down. But even more than that, it devastates our hearts. And porn use right now, whether or not you're married, this is a form of unfaithfulness. You are giving something away that belongs to your wife. And I beg you, I beg you to get free of it. To get free of it, to, to determine now today that you are going to get free of this and then you're going to go out and you're going to pursue a real woman who is out there waiting to love you and to meet you with real deep, true connection. Mm. Mm. But let's be honest. So that's kind of the deep, really rough stuff, but even just the surfacey stuff we're dealing with is kind of messed up, right? Just the way that we're interacting with each other in the dating world is, is kind of tough. I think we've got to start paying better attention to the way we're interacting, not even in those you know, deeper sexual ways, but just looking at how can we get to a healthier place in our relationships across the boards. So guys, I want to talk to you directly for a sec. Enough with the flirty texts, okay? Stop messing with girls' hearts. If you're not serious about her, then come clean and stop. <laughs> Hold yourself. Hold yourself to a higher standard. But if she has got what you truly value, then ask her out on a real date. <laughs> and by that, I do not mean saying, do you want to come over and hang out and watch Netflix? I give you permission to be romantic. And I know what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to take the risk of rejection and I know that's hard and I know that's scary. But let me tell you, there is something so incredibly attractive about a guy who's willing to put himself out there for you. As opposed, as opposed to waiting till it's all super safe and super clear to see if the girl makes the first move. Guys, girls want to be pursued. They want to know that they're worth fighting for. And if they're not even worth you feeling a little bit awkward, that says something to them. But girls, ladies, I think we need to make it a little bit easier on the guys as well. <laughs> like, enough of that. Like, we're feeling the heat. Right. Okay. I feel for them, I really do. Because here's what I think. I think they hear us cheering and saying, yes, we want to be pursued. But then do you know what they also hear? They hear the girl on the college campus when they open the door for her going, I can get my own door, right? There's a lot of that back and forth. And they're like, do you want me to help you? Do you want me to be a gentleman? Or, or is that like offending your feminist sensibilities? I don't know. Like I think a lot of the time guys are like, I don't really know, you know what I'm supposed to do here. And there's another thing that I'm seeing a lot on college campuses, and this is like super deeply disturbing me. I think in subtle ways, we are telling the young men that they need to sit down and be quiet because of men who've gone before them and have been oppressive, that they now have lost the right to speak, that they need to sit down and stop talking. 
And that's a problem because we don't elevate one group by pushing down another. We cannot have it both ways, ladies. If we emasculate men, then we cannot be surprised when they do not come out and pursue us. So this goes both ways. This goes both ways. But back to the guys who just have to make this last point. I just have to. Guys, the smart and thoughtful girls, the ones of substance, the ones that you want to end up with, they're wondering where you are. Amen. They're discouraged. They're discouraged. Don't use the so I want you to go out and to get her, to go out and fight for her because she is worth the risk of rejection. She is worth the awkwardness because she holds the key that's going to unlock what you want most in life, which is deep and real and lasting connection. <laughs> Lie number four. Tinder and other dating apps are a good way to find a life partner. <laughs> the truth. Dating apps are proven to be a waste of time. I've got the stats to back this up, people. Okay, so Tinder, Tinder says that they log 1.6 billion swipes a day, which results in 26 million matches. Now, I don't know who's really good at math, but I'll do it for you. That means that 1.6% of the time, you're getting a match when you swipe, 1.6% of the time. And let's be honest, we all know just because you get a match, does that mean you get a date? No. Does that mean that you get a date with someone based on the kind of criteria that really is gonna pan out for a good relationship? Again, no. So that's a lot of swiping without a lot of satisfying connection. So why are dating apps so popular? I'd like to suggest that they're just one more diversion. It's just another thing that we're doing on our phones. I read an article, someone said that what they have done is they've gamified interaction. And on average, people spend 10 hours a week on dating apps. And per session, men tend to spend 7.2 minutes per session and women 8.5, on average an hour and a half a day. Now I get that dating apps are less stressful because what they take out of the equation is that whole define the relationship moment that's so awkward where you're like, are we, are we feeling this? Is this for real? Because you both know you're both interested, like you both went on. So I can see that it takes some of that out of the equation, but what's the point if it rarely results in something real? You know, when I think back on how I met Leo, I was a waitress, we're in a restaurant. He was in, sitting in a section all by himself. We started talking. We fell in love. I wonder if that would have happened today. Now, if you were at a restaurant tonight by yourself, what would you be doing? I know what you'd be doing, because it's the same thing I would be doing. We would be on our phones. And that behavioral shift has major consequences. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and thinking that there's going to be a different end result. And so we're going to have to make some radical changes in our behavior if we want our relationship prospects to improve. Otherwise, we're just gonna stay at the same miserable impasse. And you know what? It starts with changing our behavior right here. Putting our phones down and starting to interact with one another. And I'm not saying put your phone down and then head up and it's like, I'm ready to find my spouse. You know, it doesn't need to be so, we just need to actually put our phones down and start being human. Like, just start having conversations with people so there isn't such an intensity that we bring to every interaction with a potential boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse. So line number five, living together before getting married is a good way to see how compatible you are. The truth, playing house might give you some of the fun of marriage, but none of the glue that makes it a success. There comes a time in many relationships when it starts to feel like a waste of money to be paying two rents, two Wi-Fi bills, two utilities, and then there's the sliding but not deciding where a move from dating goes to sleeping over, to sleeping over a lot, to living together. Cohabitation has increased 900% in 
in the past 50 years. And we are surrounded by voices that tell us that our sexuality should be explored outside of the confines of marriage. And most people would say that following God's instructions on sexuality and on marriages is archaic. And it's contrary to the natural response of our bodies, that it's oppressive, that it's restrictive. Pastor Craig Rochelle had a couple in his congregation that came to him, and they were living together, and they asked him if he would be willing to do a special ceremony for them to bless their relationship. They, they thought that might help them, and he said, I'd be happy to. They said, why don't you come into my office, and we're going to talk about your vows. And they thought that was great. So he came in, and he said, all right, so what I would love is I'd love to have the ceremony at your house, and it would be great if you would bring maybe some close some friends, some family members to be there and to be a part of it. They're like, yes, this is exactly what we wanted. He goes, okay, good. So we're going to have the ceremony in your bedroom. And they're like, that's kind of weird. I said, all right. And he goes, and these are the vows. This is how the vows will go. I, Rick, take you, Monica, to be my cohabitant, to have sex with you and to hold you responsible for half the bills, to love and take advantage of you from this day forward or as long as our arrangement works out. I will be more or less faithful to you as long as my needs are met and if nothing better comes along. If I should break up with you, it doesn't mean this wasn't special to me because I love you almost as much as I love myself. I commit to live with you for a while, so help me, me, in the name of sex, options, and selfishness, amen. Now, these weren't exactly the vows that they were hoping to hear. You know, God understands our desire for intimacy and belonging. He is the one who put those desires within us in the first place. And he knows that we're prone to look for that in the wrong places. And so he's put up guardrails, not to spoil our fun, but to protect us. Because he knows the hurt that lies on the other side of sexual sin that seems so fun in the moment. This is his protection for us as a good, good father. You know, half the couples that are living together right now are gonna break up within five years. 60% of couples living together right now are gonna break up within 10. So that means that only 40% of people who live together are gonna to actually get married. And do you know what that sounds like to me? A breeding ground for insecurity. It sounds to me like you're on audition all the time to see if you're a keeper, to see if you're worth real commitment. Acting like you're married when you're not. Having sex without the commitment of marriage will not help you to see how compatible you are. What it will do is it will confuse you. It will not increase the odds of you avoiding divorce. What it's going to do, it's gonna make it harder for you to discern if this person is right for you. Sexual compatibility is not enough to hold a marriage together, but in the moment, it can seem like it will be. The decades of the 20s have been called the Odyssey years. They're years that 20-year-olds are encouraged to explore to experiment, to wander. But when you consider that 85% of life's major defining moments happen by the time you're 35, it seems to me that the 20s are a really good decade to start paying attention to what you really want out of life and to start living accordingly, to really be engaging. And now I'm not suggesting that everybody rush out and get married immediately. I'm not giving you an ideal age to marry Rather, I'm challenging you to ignore a culture that tells you that the 20s are the time for hooking up, experimenting, and having a good time, and just figuring out what you like, instead of getting serious about what really matters in the long run. Now, that being said, I 100% believe that you should wait for the right person and not compromise in terms of character, faith, and chemistry, because you've set yourself some imaginary date, like I should be married by this point. 
I am not encouraging you to settle. And this is a word for someone sitting here right now. Don't laugh at the joke that he makes that's actually in truth making you feel objectified and used. Do not send him that photo he has asked for because you feel like that's the way to keep him. Be true to yourself. Don't compromise. And I'm not saying that you need to stay with the person that you've slept with because you've made that decision and so now there's the deal. That must be who you need to end up with. I'm not telling you to lower your standards and marry whoever is available and interested. Those are all the things that I'm not saying. But what I am saying is that waiting just for the sake of waiting is not going to ultimately get you what you want. It doesn't make much sense. It's time to move forward in the areas of life that matter most. Now, I know that all of this is hard to navigate. I, I really do. I, I feel for you with the, the whole dating scene that you're in the midst of. But I also know that you have the inner power, the strength, and the desire to have a healthy and whole and good life. In a world that longs for comfort and often settles for superficiality, your hunger for truth, justice, and holiness sets you apart. And I wish that your desire to grow closer to God, that your willingness to make the hard choices, the right choices, would mean that the enemy would like leave you alone and just leave you to do that. But I also know that nothing scares them more than young men and women who've decided that they're going to be serious about their faith. And the more committed to God you get, the more the enemy is going to tempt you to settle for mediocrity. So I am praying that you would exhale any sense of powerlessness, this sense that this feeling that things are never going to change, and that you would inhale the spirit of hope. I pray that you would exhale any sense of complacency, a desire to just settle where it's comfortable, and that you would instead inhale passion for holiness and a willingness to take risks. May you exhale any religiosity that is causing you to settle for outward behavior when what Jesus really wants from you is inner conversion and transformation. So I pray that you would inhale God's grace. And I pray most of all that God would have your heart, that hidden part of you, that most precious part of you, so that he can bring rest and peace and balance to that place within and in these few minutes that remain, I want to speak specifically and declare some truth over some people who are sitting in this room listening today. Because I believe that many of you have been living the way that God has laid out. You've been faithful. You've been obedient. And you're wondering, when is it ever going to be your turn? When are you going to be chosen? You are waiting for the right person, and you are waiting well, but the waiting is hard. And so I want to pray with you, and I want to declare some truth of Scripture over your life. God, we come to you with our dreams, with our disappointments. We come to you with hearts that long to be seen, that long to be known. We come to you as the only one who will satisfy us in the deepest places of our soul, the place where no person, no matter how amazing, will ever be able to go because it's a place that's created only for you. We come to you and we pray your own words back to you. And I declare that if we trust in the Lord God with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding, if we will acknowledge him in all our ways, then he will make our paths straight. Proverbs 5, verses 3 and 6. I declare that you heal the brokenhearted and you bind up our wounds. Psalm 147, 3. I declare that we can be strong and courageous because you go with us and you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. Deuteronomy 31, 6. 
I declare that God sets the lonely in families, Psalm 68, 6. I declare that charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised, Proverbs 31, 30. I declare that if we take delight in the Lord, if we find joy in his presence, then he will give us the desires of our heart. Psalm 37, 4. I declare that in Christ we have been brought to fullness. We are complete in Christ. Colossians 2.10. I declare that now is not a time to wallow in self-pity because each person here is God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works that he declared in advance for them to do. Ephesians 2.10. And as you said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 2 Samuel 16, 7. Now to him who is able to do infinitely more than all that we ask or imagine by the power that is at work within us, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before the presence of God without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.